Rachel and I keep in touch with a couple we got to know in Brockport who have become beloved friends over the past 15 years or so. They live in Miami now in a small efficiency apartment and recently they've shared an anxiety with us about their son who is a young man attending college in Quebec. They have anxiety about having a place for him still to visit because you see their apartment is very small. It's a true efficiency space. It's just one big room that includes a kitchen and a living space and they literally have a Murphy bed that they pull down at night to sleep in. When it came on the market, they purchased another exactly uh, similar layout apartment across the hall because they wanted their son to know that they had a place for him to come home to when they visited. And they want him to visit, just like Jesus wants the disciples to be with him down the road. Now, the plan for our friends has been to rent it out seasonally so that it's available to their son on summer break. But the problem is that as Luke has gotten older and more independent, his visits have gotten shorter and farther apart. It's starting to become a financial strain to keep this second apartment, which is empty pretty much uh, all of the year. So Christoph asked me just before Easter, are we terrible parents if we rent the apartment full time or even end up selling it? Will our son think that we're disowning him if there's not a bed waiting for his visits? These friends of ours are really beating themselves up over this quandary. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. This togetherness, this parental compassion and longing for connection that Jesus shows his disciples taps into a deep need that we feel as children wanting a safe home and, frankly, as parents wanting to provide one. And maybe it's less common today. Maybe my uh, parents came from uh, certainly a different generation, a different age where they uh, have been able to remain uh, in the home that they bought when they were a young married couple. And so um, I've always felt uh, that I've had a place in that house. Uh, they maintained my bedroom uh, way longer than they had to, way past since I moved out. Uh, finally, long overdue, Dad has uh, turned my room into his home office. And I'm, I'm glad for him to use that space. Uh, but Jesus, I think, is tapping in uh, to something that we long to provide or we long to have uh, a place that we know is safe for us to return to. But as Jesus is speaking to them, he's figuratively packing his bags as he talks. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. I'm going and I promise to return for you. But I'm going to be gone a bit, you see. But it's, it's all okay because you know the way where I am going. And out of the awkward pause, the disciples indicate that this is still kind of abstract for them. Wait, Lord, we, we don't know the way. Where are you even going? That sounds familiar too. It's like when we talk to our kids at home sometimes when they're uh, on the computer or in front of the TV, I might say, hey kids, I'm going to the store. All right, Dad. And their eyes uh, remain glazed over and they don't um, break from the screen or 
really acknowledge me to my satisfaction. And so I'll say, Robin, Sylvia, where did I say that I was going? And their heads snap around and they say, wait, what, you're going somewhere? That's what I thought. So then Philip follows up. He says, show us the Father. What did Philip mean when he said, Lord Jesus, show us the Father? Did he, did he expect some great magical head to appear in the air like in the Wizard of Oz? Do we expect flashy special effects so much that we are dissatisfied with the evidence that is, that is right in front of us? We are in a difficult stretch of this pandemic right now. I was speaking with a colleague uh, this week and he likened it to the Lenten wilderness. We have been doing this for nine, going on 10 weeks now, and it really seems like it should have been over a while ago. What crisis lasts this long? In the middle of Lent, we had perfect themes to reflect on, on suffering and endurance, but we're in the middle of Easter, folks. We're coming up on the end of Easter, actually. It doesn't feel like resurrection, even yet. We are still huddled in those closed off rooms with the disciples. Jesus had been teaching them about the kingdom of God and doing more than teaching throughout his ministry. With him, they, they fed the multitudes. They welcomed women and children and outcasts. They healed the sick. They cured the lame. They, they set the spirits of the people in bondage free. Jesus had been living out the way and the truth and the life with them. He had been showing them the kingdom of God all along. I hear Jesus saying, the way before you is simple, guys. Just, just keep doing what we have been doing. If you believe in me and, and what we've been doing together all this time, then, then you have all you need to know. And in the future, you will do even greater works than these together. Historically, Christians have been known for sponsoring hospitals and medical missions because of Jesus' focus on healing. His focus on compassion and healing has caused us to sponsor these front lines of medical science and to be on the front lines of medical science in many cases. When Jesus says greater things than these, though, does Jesus mean all of the medical missions and these denomination, uh, denominationally sponsored hospitals? He says you will cure diseases, perhaps, maybe with amazing vaccines. You will cause the lame to walk. Maybe he means even amputees will stand up on carbon fiber limbs and look us in the eye and smile. Is this what he means? I don't know. It very well may be. But verses 11 and 12 seem to me, though, to get to the real point of what this story is about, though. Jesus says, believe in me for whatever reason you can. Believe in me and let's get to work. Jesus gives us many, many reasons and ways to reach him because he came to reach us first. And so whatever we need to believe or to trust in Jesus, it will be there. Experience him directly, hear the testimony of his great deeds, or just trust because you want and need to trust, but just do it because there's work to do. There's more important work to be done than to sit and round and figure who is in and who is out. Verse 12 points us back to the church's mission, healing and living and teaching about the kingdom of God. These are the great works that we do in Jesus' name. And it's important to be busy with the mission of healing and bringing out about the kingdom. We don't need to be, to be gathering on Carr Avenue to do that. God is reinforcing for us, perhaps, the lesson that maybe we learned after Hurricane Florence that the physical church address is irrelevant. The church building is all of us, and we are the church wherever we are. 
support the work of healing in our community, in our world, live the kingdom of God for the benefit of others, even if that means connecting in a distant way. Friends, the flu of 1918 lasted for 36 months. That was before coordinated medical responses. It was before vaccines. We are in a much better position this time. It won't take 36 months, but it will take more time than we are accustomed to giving. As Jesus packed his bags, Jesus was comforting his disciples, keeping connection to them, letting them know that connection would continue, giving them the confidence of a ground of support to fall back on for the work that he knew was ahead, which Jesus also gives to us as we walk through this wilderness. May it be so. Amen.